Kyle Hawk and Carlton at Carlton Carnivores here. Today is day three of our Oklahoma trip, or our Kansas trip, but we're, uh, you know the flub there. Uh, we're cheating a little bit on Kansas and we're actually down in Oklahoma right now, uh, checking out some areas in hopes that maybe we can find a uh, timber rattlesnake or a uh, copperhead down here. This is an area where the uh, woodlands kind of start to meander up towards Kansas in little pockets and gallery forests. So keep an eye out and hope for something good on the road. Yep, at the start of the day we headed south and dipped over into Oklahoma to poke around just because we could. Uh, started by driving through some beautiful gallery forests and past a couple of little farms that were covered in red clover. No idea if this is wild or if it was actually planted for a reason, but beautiful either way. And it didn't take long before our wildlife started to show up. All right, our first find for the day looks like a box turtle of some kind. And looks like it's an ornate box turtle. Hey, little dude. All right, our first reptile for the day, another little ornate box turtle. He's poking his head out. You can see in the sun here, colors on the sides of his legs, it was really pretty. He's got this oranges on his scales there, really bright red eyes. Still a young guy, these guys will get a fair bit bigger than this. But we'll help him cross the road so that he doesn't get hit by anybody coming through. And then keep searching. Hopefully you're a good omen, right? Now the ornate box turtle is a pretty familiar sight back home, in fact there's probably one that's still poking around somewhere in my backyard, but I don't think I've ever seen them around here with leg scales quite that bright red. And of course this guy has absolutely beautiful red eyes in contrast with that kind of olive green head that he's got. Now uh, you can see here that these guys have rather elephantine feet, they've got stocky legs that kind of sit partly under their body to kind of help support their weight. However, these guys are not quite considered true tortoises because um, the legs are not quite that thick. They don't support that much of their weight on those legs. Rather, they, in part, half the time, just kind of scoot along the ground using them. He's ready to go. Okay, good. Get you over on this side. There you go. do it. He'll, he'll be good off the side of the road there, so we'll leave him be. All right, we got ourselves a second little turtle here. And it looks like, yep, another ornate box turtle with a really bright head. My goodness. So we'll get him. Hopefully we can get him out. You. Now, he comes to the, he's in the sun. This is another male, too. Hopefully we can get him to come out, because he's got some absolutely beautiful colors on his front legs and his head. I don't know if you can actually see him there or not. The bright red scales on his forelimbs, and an almost chartreuse yellow head. We'll see if he comes out here. If I kind of set down here, maybe he'll be encouraged to come out. Trying to get him to come out, because he's got this and if I had thought the previous box turtle was a pretty one, he was nothing compared to this guy whose his head literally almost glowed in person under the sun. Uh, unfortunately, unlike the other guy who was perfectly ready to run off as soon as we put him down, this one was a little bit shyer and so we didn't get much more than his head poking out of the shell for a little bit, but that's alright. Still enough time to get some shots of that beautiful yellow head and some of the really pretty red scales on his legs. Now the reason why I'd pick this area of the country to come and visit at this time of year is because the sheer variety of habitats that are in the area from seepages and prairies throughout the area to the gallery forests filled with uh, hardwood oaks running down into more riparian habitats, places where 
a number of different species from rattlesnakes to copperheads to king snakes to ribbon snakes to so much more can be found. So while we were down in Kansas, certainly I was continuing to try and follow some of these gallery forests to find the animals that we hadn't seen yet. And while some of the snakes were still a bit of el elusive, there was still other uh, wildlife to be found in the area. We've got a little velvet mite crawling around in here. They look like ticks, but they're actually predators of other smaller arthropods and harmless to people. Funny little creatures. One of the areas that we stopped within a larger stretch of forest had a small creek running through it, and you can actually see me down on the banks there poking around. This area had a lot of little frogs, and also, finally, the first snake of the day. All right, down near the river here, first snake of the day, and another brand new species for me. This is one of the uh, subspecies of western ribbon snake. I'll have to double check which one is right around here when I get back to the car, but this is, I believe, Thamnophis proximus subspecies, and Ribbon snakes, they are a species, actually a couple of different species of garter snake. And one of the ways you can tell is, first off, ribbon snakes are ridiculously skinny compared to other garter snakes. And on their head, in front of their eye, they have this little white patch right in front of the eye that most other garter snakes do not have. So just like garter snakes, though, these guys are fairly aquatic, and they like to eat fish and frogs and little invertebrates like slugs and worms. And while like all other garter snakes, they are rear fang venomous, they are entirely harmless to people because first off, it's hard for one of these guys to even try and bite you. Second off, their venom is only meant to stun slugs, basically. So another lesson that venomous does not always be mean dangerous. Rather, sometimes it just means how this cute little snake catches its food. <laughs> You're so cute, look at you. Alright, we'll get a few photos and then get them released. Part of the, uh, part of the Nutricidae family, formerly classified as part of the uh, Colubrids, the uh, garter snakes are um, a fairly widespread group in North America, and the two different species of ribbon snakes are found across most of the eastern half of the U.S. The western ribbon snake is found throughout most of the uh, Midwest and Great Plains region, with this particular subspecies, the orange striped ribbon snake, being found uh, across that widest range. Uh, these guys, of course, are relatively slender, hence the name ribbon snake, and they tend to eat very small uh, prey items and they are usually never found very far from water. Semi-aquatic, so they like to swim, but you will also often find them in the bushes uh, and grasses along the edges of these streams, waterways, or swamps. Here he goes. Ooh, and he's gone. Into the weeds. All right, we got here, looks like, Another little Blanchard's cricket frogs that I mistakenly called tree frogs yesterday. Same little species. Pretty sure these guys I've heard calling a couple times this year, but only recently I've been hearing more chorus frogs. Take a photo and let him go on his way. An exceedingly common species as it would turn out. There's a couple more that'll be coming up later in the video that show a little more variety that I'll talk more about. All right, we got another species here, it looks like. This might be the three-toed box turtle. We'll get some video of him. <laughs> so, I think we have just found ourselves our first three-toed box turtle, and I think it's a male, because he's got the curved plaster underneath. He's all closed up right now, but you can see, unlike the ornates, these guys don't have all the interesting patterns here, but if he ever decides to pop his head out, they have much more colorful uh, heads and necks than the box turtles typically do. A lot of spots and sometimes bright red and orange colors. So hopefully we can convince him to come on out a little bit at some point. It's starting to open up. So I'll quiet down and we'll give him a maybe get some photos of him pop, pop on, ah, popping out. Excuse the dyslexia. 
The three-toed box turtle is a brand new species for me, uh, one that's only found, this is about as far west as they come, give or take, and uh, they're a rather interesting species, named first off for the number of toes that they have on their hind feet, only three, uh, with some four-toed individuals thought to possibly be actually representing uh, hybrid individuals. Uh, like most other box turtles, these guys are kind of omnivores. They like to eat uh, various vegetation, berries, and fruits, but they will also take earthworms, uh, eggs. Uh, they will even feast on carrion when they find it. And this species in particular seems to have rather interesting uh, humidity requirements, and they will actually migrate in order to maintain their preferred humidity levels, often in the spring being found more in open, grassy areas, and then as summer comes in, they will actually migrate into more forested habitats in places where they have a more varied habitat. Uh, further down in the south, because these guys range through kind of the central Midwest down to the Gulf, Gulf Coast, uh, they will inhabit often almost entirely forests, or occasionally they'll pop up in people's backyards as well. And while at first glance these guys are not as flashy as the ornate box turtles are, they are still often quite beautiful animals. Uh, the males in particular tend to have uh, on their necks and sometimes their front limbs, they'll have spots of orange or bright white and yellow. And while it took a while for this guy to finally start showing that off, he proved himself to be a male as he finally stuck his head out and showed us all those pretty spots down the sides of his neck. Going the wrong way, dude. We'll turn you around in a sec here, but we wanted some good video of you. We're going this way, dude. Come here. Yeah, I know. He's his. After the box turtle, we headed a little bit further southwest to a uh, local reservoir in the area that I was hoping would find some uh, perhaps water-related animals nearby. Uh, we found a few beautiful flowers first near the parking lot, and then uh, on the way down, Nathan finally got his shot of the turkey vultures that have been in the area at a decent distance. Unfortunately, feeding on some recently deceased other wildlife, which I will blur out. Now being near a reservoir, no surprise, one of the first things that we found was frogs. So Nathan spotted this guy. I think it's a far more colorful tree frog, or cricket frog. So we'll get a closer look in a sec here. There we go. Yeah, so this is another little cricket frog with a fantastically greener back than we've been seeing. So it's one of the many variations that these cricket frogs can kind of show off. And I'm glad I found one with the bright green on his back, as opposed to all the dull grays that we've been seeing previously. So we'll let him be back on his way. He's been sitting out on this rather dry uh, step area. I mean, there's a bit of moisture under the rock, rock crack, so he might be hiding there. But he'll also probably head down to the water to get more moisture if he needs it. So we'll let him on his way here. This guy's a great example of some of the variation that you can see in this species, as up until this point, all that I have been used to seeing are the relatively drab brown guys with maybe a bit of pattern on the sides. But in this guy, we can see an example of some of the bright colors that they can uh, show off as well. That brilliant green on top of his head and running down his back. Uh, this is sometimes actually modeled into the background of their pattern, and you will also occasionally see others with rusty colors or more darkened stripes across them their backs. Head one. Well then that is a problem. That's the same as not adding one.
Let's see. I'm gonna check up here real quick. It's a log. Nothing. this. This is another one of the many fossorial species that we have around here. They're almost always underground. And they do get a little bit bigger than this. Uh, this is probably last year's baby. Uh, they get to around maybe a foot, foot and a half long. So they're not huge. But they eat small invertebrates like slugs and worms underground. Maybe they'll take very small uh, other snakes or lizards and eggs. And usually, they're often food for other animals. So, yet another new species for the trip, and an adorable little one at that. So just like the ribbon snake, these guys are also natricines. And just like the uh, line snake and a couple of the other species that we've seen so far on this trip, uh, they're called rough earth snakes, again, just like the rough green snake, because they have keeled scales that run down their backs. And they used to be in the same genus as the smooth earth snakes, but were recently uh, separated out into Haldia. I'm not entirely sure why, I'll have to look into that. Uh, but these guys are roughly kind of the same size as the smooth earth snakes. They just, they have those rough scales across their backs. And they are almost always this fairly matte, grayish pewter coloration which helps them blend into the soil that they live in most of the time. And I probably uh, guessed a little too young for this snake. He's probably two, maybe three years old. They do, uh, they give live birth and they come out fairly small, but they do only get about a foot, foot and a half in length at most. So like a lot of other snakes in the US, these guys are tiny. Alright, so we'll let this guy go here. He was under this rock, which somebody has moved at some previous time, but he's made it his house, so we'll leave it where we found it. And there he goes. He'll burrow himself right under there. Bye-bye. I don't think he must be. There he goes. Nada. Such a really weird looking beetle. Okay, we'll just use the hands. Nobody. Shoot. How am I gonna flip this guy? Cause it's moving. Nothing. Okay. Move the rock back in place. There we go. Always put your rocks back. Just sitting down on the path here, we have a leopard frog. I'll have to double check what species this is because we have both plains and southerns in this area, I believe. Got some really pretty, almost iridescent green right on his back. Don't know if I'll be able to catch him or not, but we'll get a couple photos first just to make sure. Beautiful animal. So no, we did not manage to catch this guy, but that's all right. We did get a couple of nice photos, and this does turn out to be a southern leopard frog, which is a brand new species for me, uh, Lithobates sphenocephala. Uh, you can tell these guys apart from uh, their relative in the area, the plains leopard frog, because uh, these guys tend to have a little bit more green in their pattern, they're a little bit lighter. This guy in particular had some pretty uh, green, especially right around the spots, and kind of this silvery sheen to his background color. They also lack the uh, spot that the plains and northern leopard frogs tend to have right on their snout, and those light dorsolateral lines that you see running down either side of the back is unbroken in both the northern and the southern leopard frogs, but there's a distinct break in plains leopard frogs. Now these guys are a medium-sized frog getting to almost four inches long, and they are actually more terrestrial than a lot of other uh, 
uh, relatives in their groups, like the bullfrogs and such, so they can also sometimes be found a fair distance from water. Let's see if the video will focus on it. We got bright green tiger beetle right there. They'll run off as soon as we get any closer, so I'll just take some shots here. Cool. After we found this guy, we found a, a couple of uh, other small uh, cricket frogs in the area, one that had a very nice rusty stripe as opposed to the bland uh, brown or even the green guy, so another bit of variety. And then passed by a water snake that I missed at first, so I continued poking around along the uh, shoreline and then turned back and as we came back, managed to see him again. So I have no idea if I'm going to catch him. There's a huge water snake right there and I'm pretty sure it's a plain belly. Nerodia erythrogaster. I'm going to try. I don't have any guarantees because he's already on to me and I'm 10 feet away. Oh! That is a huge water snake, my goodness. Wow. Oh my goodness, he's had something to take a chunk out of his side at some point, too. Look at this snake. Oh. Yeah, I know. You're going to try and get me, aren't you? Yeah, I'm not holding you. Hey, you're okay. Look at you. So I'm pretty sure this is a uh, Nerodia erythrogaster, plain-bellied water snake. He's fading out the pattern. Doesn't have the right pattern for either the uh, northern... And certainly not the uh, diamondback water. Uh, this is about as big as they get. I'm pretty sure this is an adult female. As you might expect, they eat fish and frogs mainly. And a big snake like this will give live birth to sometimes upwards of a hundred babies at a time. So we'll get a few photos and then let her be on her way. So it was a really lucky catch that allowed me to get this girl too because the area was full of holes made by either muskrats or beavers that she could have darted under and instead she basically went almost under my feet. But anyway, the plain-bellied water snake is a species that used to be split up into a number of different subspecies but uh, recent genetic studies have suggested that all the different subspecies are actually just local color variants that we were naming. Um, the common name, plain belly, of course, comes from the fact that, as you saw, there's really no pattern on these snakes' bellies, unlike um, a lot of other water snake species. And their Latin name, erythrogaster, comes from uh, the color form of one of the more easterly variations, which erythro means red and gaster means belly. So there were some that used to be called red-bellied water snakes. Now these are a fairly large uh, snake, although they don't get quite as big as some of the diamondback water snakes do. But because of their relatively drab pattern and the fact that they are found across most of the southeastern U.S., they are quite frequently confused with the cottonmouth, with which there are quite a few differences, including the eyes on top of the heads. They don't have scales that cover those eyes. Uh, the scalation, the keels are different, and a few other things. Um, but because they're confused so often, these guys are quite often needlessly killed uh, because they are thought to be the venomous cottonmouth, which... Try not to kill venomous snakes either because not only are they beneficial to the environment, but also in trying to kill the snake, you are a lot more likely to hurt yourself than uh, the snake is actually going to hurt you. Or the snake is a lot more likely to end up biting you than if you were to simply leave it alone. Now, the water snakes here, these are also natricids, just like the garter snakes, just like the smooth earth or the rough earth snakes and so on that we have seen uh, previously. and like their name suggests, they live in and around water, they are highly aquatic, and they love fish and frogs as food. There you go. <laughs> Once they realize they're not in danger, they can often calm down and not be too apt to bite. She knows now she's not actually going to get hurt, so she's not flaring up trying to nip me. But we won't bother her too much longer, and we'll let her go on her way now. frog these guys are kind of everywhere out on the rocks here 
Jump, jump. Hi. You're not jumping. What are you doing? There you go. <laughs> there he goes. Can't see him, but we don't know what he is. Fantastic I call, though. The the uh, he's down, kind of halfway down in. Got a racer here, and there's a truck coming by. Just making sure he doesn't come. Yeah. While we stood there to make sure that the truck wouldn't run over this poor guy, I immediately noticed the coloration of this particular snake. Very different from the one that we saw a few days before. There we go. Alright, we got a beautiful yellow-bellied racer here on the road. It's getting a little darker because uh, we're starting to get a little bit of a black racer influence in the population here. And they'll get a whole lot darker as you go further east, but here we start to get this beautiful kind of slaty blue color on the top with the yellow on the bottom. So, we'll grab him and see if I can, oh, we'll see if I can do so before he bolts here. Hi. Yep, there he goes. Are you gonna be a bitey one? Or are you gonna be nice? There we go. Beautiful racer. Look at that yellow belly. Kind of greens and blues on the side. Nice. Yeah, you're okay. Look at you. There we go. Yeah, you're okay, aren't you? A lot of them are really bitey, but sometimes you get a few that just kind of seem to figure out you're not actually going to endanger them, so they calm down. We'll get him across the road after a few photos here. So if you haven't seen the first Kansas video yet, do definitely go check that out where we found the first yellow-bellied racer of the trip. But this was certainly, I think, the prettier one in my opinion because of that influence that's just starting to come in in this region with these beautiful kind of slaty browns and blues and grays on this guy. Now the uh, racer is a true colubrid. It hasn't been moved out into any other family yet, uh, although there is a bit of a... Uh, an argument over whether or not these guys should be lumped in with some of the other uh, racers and whip snakes in other genera in North America. Um, the, as the name suggests, these are usually very, very fast animals. They thrive in the high heat of the day and they run down their prey. They don't constrict, they don't have venom, rather they literally rely on speed to catch their food. And they tend to prey on fast-moving lizards and also other snakes, including sometimes venomous snakes. Now there's probably a couple of different things that contributed to why this guy is being nice to us. Um, one, there are occasionally individuals that are just a lot more mild-mannered than most racers are, and so they will allow you to handle them. In fact, even Mom got into doing that for a little bit. But also, it could be just this day was a little cooler since we had the storm that came through earlier in that day, and so he was just not warmed up enough to really get moving. All right, Mom's doing the honors of the release this time. Absolutely beautiful racer. He was heading off to this side, so we'll just put him out this way. There you go, dude. Well, okay, that's not that's not released. That's not running away. Come on, dude, you gotta move on. <laughs> we'll get him going. This is one of the things that makes me think it was probably just the temperature of the day that made him not really that much uppity, is that he just wanted to sit there. Although could be he was just getting ready to kind of recharge so that he could continue moving on. It did afford us a chance to get some really nice close-up photos of him though and then just kind of savor this nice snake before the uh, somewhat disappointing next find that we discovered. I fear this might be roadkill already but this is one of the big species we were hoping to find down here and that's a timber rattlesnake. Damn. Okay. Looks like it. Well, 
It means they're out on the move. So hopefully there are others out here. Damn. We've got ourselves a second speck. Oh, yeah, second speckled king here, and this one's an adult. This one's an adult. Hey, you! Don't run yet. Look at you. Hi. Oh, look at you. I don't need this. That is a beautiful adult speckled king snake. You may want to get to the side. As they come over that hill. So this is what they look like as they grow up. He could still lose what's left of his little bands here on the top of his pattern, but otherwise every single scale has a little yellow speck within either black or kind of deep brownish silver. That is a beautiful snake to find. And these guys will eat baby timber rattlesnakes, copperheads. So a lot of people like to label them as good snakes. But it's important to keep in mind there's no such thing as a bad snake. Only one that uses constriction to catch prey versus one that uses venom. So we'll get a few photos of these guy and then let him keep going where he was heading off that way. After the heartbreak of the timber, this was definitely a needed find. I've only ever seen one adult speckled king before, and I only had one photo of him late at night before he later on got away from us. So this is an absolutely amazing animal. Uh, you can see, of course, why they are called speckled kings, because they, they have that beautiful, just speckled pattern all over them. And it creates incredibly high contrast, and some of them can be really high yellow, like this one seems to be. Others tend to kind of turn whitish. These guys will get up to about five feet long, and you can imagine a five-foot speckled king, just what that looks like stretched out. And they're usually fairly active at night, so the fact that we found this one crawling around during the day was a really special treat. Uh, we'll get him off into the brush here. After the king snake, we continued to meander kind of in and out of Oklahoma and Kansas, finding some really cool scenery right along that border, some really old bridges and a couple of small parks and towns that are all but forgotten in time, and eventually kind of moved northward a little bit through part of the area that we had traveled the day before, hoping that we could catch one more timber, but alas, to no avail. And of all things, our day was finished off with wild turkeys. We got ourselves some wild turkey. Do not run in front of the car, Mr. Turkey, please. Thank you. So overall, I would say day three has been a success. Still a little myth that the one timber that we saw was a DOR, but hopefully in the uh, next day coming, we can change that around. But one way or another, speckled king snake adult is a pretty good way to uh, finish out the day. So uh, hopefully we'll see some more good stuff tomorrow, and you'll see that in the next video coming up. If not, well, wherever the next adventure takes us. Uh, until then, as always, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping uh, support the production of these videos. Uh, Denise, Jana, Sandy, and Nathan. And if you would like to help support, uh, please consider joining at www.patreon.com slash hcarlton. Uh, every little bit helps uh, supporting the website, uh, being able to afford taking trips out to find wildlife to bring up back to all of you guys online. 
And of course, all of my patrons get additional benefits on the account there. Uh, if you can't uh, do a monthly support, uh, consider uh, checking out the website, carltoncarnivores.com. We have plants for sale there. There's the resin gem jewelry that I make from the uh, snake skins from the animals at home. Uh, there's also the links for the Teespring shop on the website, on the main page, as well as the contact page. Uh, you can always find uh, merch there. Uh, or if you can't afford to uh, help support that way right now, you can always just like and subscribe here, share the videos, because the more attention it gets, the more help that is. And then you can always also follow me on social media, Carlton Carnivores on Instagram, Facebook, or even TikTok. But until next time, I'm Hawk and Carlton. This is Carlton Carnivores.